Well, uh, hello everybody uh, again to our current SIPO colloque. I'm happy, well, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Mark Stevenson from the University of Melbourne from Australia for today's uh, SIPO colloque uh, on the interlinkages between mobility and public transport. Uh, before we start with the thematic presentation, we uh, would like to shortly give you uh, an introduction of our work in Luxembourg. So what the SIPU is about, what we do, and just to uh, settle a bit the scene and the context about our activities. Well, the SIPU is a contractual agreement, or we call it a conven convention in Luxembourg between five players, which is the National Ministry of Spatial Planning, the National Ministry of Housing, but also the cities of uh, Luxembourg City, esch sur in the south and Dudelange in the south, which are the three major cities in Luxembourg in terms of population sizes. So what we speak about here is Luxembourg City is um, about 120,000 in inhabitants, Esch is about 30 to 40,000, and Dudelange should be about 30,000 30, inhabitants as well. So I think in contrast to the biggest Australian city, a little smaller than you um, uh, usually deal with. Um, our activities comprise... Um, Sebastian, yeah? we can't see the presentation, your presentation. Oh, okay. Thanks for the interruption. Um, is it maybe possible to switch between the presentation? If not, I can continue with our presentation. I don't think it's so important to, to that you see it. Okay. Well, then I continue with that. I think that's not an issue. Sorry for the inconveniences. Okay. Uh, what we usually organize is a series of workshops uh, with Luxembourgish planners for Luxembourgish planners. So a lot of our activities um, are addressing planning challenges that are identified in certain topics where we uh, try to find solutions, applied solutions to very concrete problems, and then also publish um, uh, good practices or guidance on uh, specific issues in the fields that we have identified. So this year's topic is actually a climate change adaptation and um, urban planning in times of change, where we see how um, how urban planning can react also to the changing uh, environment, be it, for instance, environmental changes, but also changes in the current pandemic. As we've seen, um, urban planning can be quite reactive. And what we usually do is, based on this workshop, we gather new knowledge um, documented and then publish it also on our web pages. Uh, last year's topic was a large urban project before we had affordable housing. And um, we but also our activities comprise the research of good practices from Luxembourg and the description of those in English language that we publish on an English blog and also um, in a more structured approach on our website and under uh, project descriptions. Yes, this is a short summer summary of the activities that we do. And um, for today, um, well, today's event is, uh, happens in the series of uh, Sipu Colloq which is a series of lectures or online lectures that we organize as a small replacement of uh, the workshop that we usually hold. And uh, I'm very happy that our invitation of, uh, from Mark, to Mark Stevenson from the University of Melbourne was accepted. And I would like to welcome you, Mark. Thanks for joining today. And um, I think there's nothing else to say from my side. And therefore, I would leave the stage to you. Then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and you can hear me clearly? Great. Yes. Uh, look, thank you for the opportunity to present um, some of the work that we are undertaking here at the University of Melbourne uh, through um, a research lab that I head called the uh, Transport, Health and Urban Design Research Lab. Um, so I just want to, what I'm going to cover is just discuss the interrelationships between land use decisions, transport and public health. Um, and public health particularly is a front of mind given the current pandemic that we all live through. Um, so I think this is an incredibly important element to urban planning and sustainable cities. Uh, and although much of the research I'm going to present tonight or today for you um, is around um, urban form, urban design and what we can achieve in that regard in relation to health outcomes and, and health co-benefits, um, I think it's important to put it in a context that much of our city form uh, that we know and live in around the world 
uh, you know, it has has enormous historical elements to it. And uh, I think I, I like, always like to present at the beginning just to put that in context. Um, if we think, and I'm like, there are many case studies of this around the world, but if we just look at the the city probably closer to you in Luxembourg, namely Paris, um, you know, it, it went through enormous transformation in terms of its urban form and urban design uh, in in the 1870s uh, as a consequence of Bonaparte coming back from exile in the UK in London, uh, where he had seen, you know, this transformation occurring in London, particularly around sanitation and the real health code benefits associated with that rollout of sanitation and and. and um, and wanted to replicate the same in Paris, which at the time, whilst he was in exile, had, had grown enormously in population. It was dark, dank, and massive spread of disease, um, you know, particularly cholera. So, you know, really, if you think about placemaking now, this is, you know, really what happened in the 1870s on a grand scale in Paris. And the city of lights that we now, you know, refer to Paris as really is a direct consequence of massive urban design and transformation that was not only, um, you know, a consequence of trying to maintain some control over the population in terms of autonomy and, and politics, but also through the need and desire to ensure that there was good health outcomes in that city. So that is... Um, one of many examples. I mean, I, I've spent study leave in Barcelona, and Barcelona is a, has a, a, a similar sort of history in terms of its urban design, uh, particularly with health co benefits at the at the fore. Um, and even in the city here I live in now in Melbourne, um, the early designs, even in, in planning design in, in urban planning, uh, there were references in the documentation uh, around at the time that Melbourne was growing as a consequence of the gold rush era in the 1800s, um, the miasma theory, which was uh, basically that disease was transmitted on, on the air, through the air, and putrid smelling air was a sign that you were potentially exposed to horrendous disease. Um, that was the, the, the theory of the time. And just as we have theories now about the transmission of COVID. Um, so they designed the cities, the, the streets in Melbourne to be incredibly wide so that there was very good flow of air up and, and through those cities, as you can, through, through those streets, as you can see in this picture. Now, it was not only just for transport reasons, also to allow the horse and cart to turn, but it very much was around the need for. Um, for clean air and therefore the health of citizens. So that's a really useful context to understand that what we're going to talk about now in the 21st century and how our cities are designed or need to be designed um, have it's right at its roots, you know, some of these very early city designs and urban form um, from famous cities uh, such as Paris. So, when we started to look at this, um, sorry, I'm, I've just got to let my dog out of the room for one minute. I think that only happens in online lectures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell we're at home. Yeah, exactly. um, sorry, so the integration, I, I guess, I, you know, I come at this, uh, I, I'm just by background, I'm not an urban planner. I'm an epidemiologist by training. I've trained in public health. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the interplay between how our cities are designed, uh, how our transport systems operate in those cities, and, and the effects on our health. Uh, and much of my research over the last sort of five to 10 years has really focused on that inter interaction between those various urban systems. And it's incredibly important to understand that those systems all interact, as you probably well do and, and know, particularly in many of your cross-disciplinary um, uh, uh, activities that you do within the, the built environment. Um, so what I wanted to highlight is just some, I think, some very interesting work that we did where we looked at how does land use influence uh, the transport mode choices that people have in cities? And then what effects do those transport choices have on our health? Uh, and so particularly what I'm looking at here is our health and well-being. Um, 
And we took a number of cities around the world and looked at the relationships between land use, transport modes and health. And, and this study is one of the first to truly quantify the um, health burden associated with the urban design of the city and, uh, and the transport choices that people in cities have um, and uh, the influence it has on their health. So these were the cities we looked at, Melbourne, London, and Boston, uh, Delhi, Sao Paulo, and Copenhagen. Um, and we selected these cities for a variety of reasons. Um, firstly, we, we wanted cities that, had, uh, that were either high income cities uh, like Melbourne, like London. Um, we wanted cities that were middle income um, in terms of development as well, uh, like Sao Paulo. And we wanted cities that had quite unique um, transport modes, so like Delhi, um, and like Copenhagen, we were particularly interested in, uh, and I think, you know, as, as you would all well be aware, Copenhagen tends to be used as a, as a framework almost for the, the new urban mobility, the ability to have at least a third of, of transport trips undertaken using sustainable uh, modes such as walking and cycling. Um, and this slide here really just highlights the, that diversity that I just mentioned. It, it highlights the various forms of transport that these cities uh, deliver. Uh, and it was interesting that we had both Melbourne and Boston that were entirely car dependent. You know, we're pretty much over 85% of all car of all um, trips in, in Melbourne are undertaken by um, motor vehicle, private motor vehicle. And it's similar within Boston. And yet, you know, Melbourne has a, quite a comprehensive public transit system. So, um, but nonetheless, it just highlights just how frequently we use our private motor vehicles. Right through then to Copenhagen that has that really integrated um, multimodal transport system. Uh, and, and useful just to highlight that both Sao Paulo and, Dal and Delhi, where both sort of middle income and middle to low income cities had uh, diverse transport. So then what we did is, um, this is quite a comprehensive piece of work and I'm not presenting it all now. I just want to pick out a few highlights. What we wanted to do was once we had developed the framework and the modeling for this study, uh, what I wanted to look at is how do we, how can we influence the health of our cities, of citizens in our cities by changing our land use and changing our transport mode choices? And what could we achieve if we choose to do that? Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm particularly interested, I remember talking with Lex in relation to the initiative that Luxembourg were taking, uh, where you were taking in relation to um, free public transit, because I think so some of the results from this work will give you some insight around just what the health code benefits could be accrued as a consequence of something like that. So what I modelled here is <clears throat> what we refer to as, and you well know, is a, a compact city. A city of short distances where people um, can walk to public transit, walk to schools or cycle to schools, um, cycle to the necessary amenities that are needed. Um, and so what we wanted to look at is what if we were able to change then uh, our land use decisions in planning and, and densify our cities. Um, so what we were looking at is what if we were able to, uh, if the, there was an increase in land use density, say reduce distances to public transport by about 30%, and what if we could increase diversity of land use by about 30%. Uh, and what really that meant was if just to give an illustration of what that sort of 30% proportion really meant in Melbourne, um, what we were talking about is, uh, um, I think, majority up to 14% um, of all car trips. Uh, are under five kilometres in distance. So in fact, there was an opportunity there that those 14% of car trips could be made into um, public transit or walking or cycling trips if we were able to ensure that the amenities were at closer proximity to places of residence or, or places of work and the like. So uh, it was sort of talking, you know, in terms of distances of uh, uh, moving from about a 1.8 kilometre radius down to about a 1.3 kilometre radius. Um, and we also looked at what if the state government in, in Victoria, for example, which is Melbourne's the capital of, um, what if we were able to change our transport policy to support a 10% modal shift 
uh, from private motor vehicle, vehicle kilometres travelled to cycling, walking or public transit. So the sort of exciting initiative that Luxembourg has undertaken in relation to um, providing free public transit is a way of, you know, is an important policy strategy to move people from one mode to another. Um, and there's just a whole array of sustainability wins in relation to that. So uh, just looking at that model again, um, stylistic mode here, really what we we're doing here is just saying, okay, so we've got greater levels of land use density in terms of population density and housing density. We have um, reduced the distances between public transit and place of residence. So we've ensured that amenities have you know, reasonable access or closer access to um, important elements that determine whether they use a car or not. Um, and importantly, we focused on the diversity of land use, ensuring that uh, we don't Repl replicate the ongoing urban sprawl and that we have a uh, diverse land use. We then sort of what we're focusing in this model is then saying, okay, we're taking 10% of car trips and we're distributing them across these sustainable modes of transport. Our, our public transport in Melbourne, for example, is clean. It's run on uh, clean energy and it's trams. We have the biggest uh, number of, you know, the largest tram network in the world. Uh, and it's also trains are all run on electricity. So it's all clean, sustainable. Now, clearly there are some risk exposures dependent on the type of um, uh, transport mode choice you use, whether it's carbon based and so the CO2 emissions or NO2, um, there's trauma as a consequence of the you know, private motor vehicle use. Uh, and clearly, there are a lot of sedentary behaviours associated with private motor vehicle use, and, and that's a risk to our health. Uh, and then what we looked at is, is our health and wellbeing. And I, we've got a special metric that we use in public health that I'm not going to go into tonight or today. Um, but this is the outcome of that work and that modeling. Um, and really what it highlights is, um, uh, on, let me just see, I may have put the wrong slide in here, but basically this one's just looking at changes in particular emissions. I, I thought I had the burden, let me, uh, next slide uh, is, has got that. So that's useful to know. This is just to highlight what, what do we see in relation to changes in emission as a consequence of that policy, that transport policy. So akin to like what Luxembourg has, has looked at and by providing public transit and hopefully seeing greater uptake of that in, in terms of in preference to private motor vehicles, you see these massive reductions in particular emissions, which uh, I've just finished doing a systematic review on premature mortality and PM 2.5. And it shows that there is considerable burden of premature mortality associated with um, exposure to particulate matter. Um, so it's a win in terms of reductions in emissions, but let's just have a look at the overall gains in health that you get through such a, a change in our urban design, our land use. Um, and you can see here that uh, if I just look at maybe um, uh, Melbourne, for example, the biggest gains, these positive numbers mean that they are the 679 disability adjusted life years gained per 100,000 population. So it's not saying we get 679 years gained, but it's a, it's a, a complex sort of uh, outcome measure that we use, but, but suffice to say that if the number's positive, it's a good measure. If it's negative, it's a it's an adverse measure. So it actually affects your health and and is poor to it. It leads to poorer health. Um, so you can see by if we densified our cities and built towards more compact cities, and we actually um, were able to move people onto sustainable modes of transport like public transit, you actually get real gains in cardiovascular disease, you get gains in type 2 diabetes, you get little, you know, some gains in respiratory disease. They're, they're pretty small here in Melbourne. We don't have huge um, challenges with um, with air pollution, but if you look across here at Delhi, you certainly get considerable gains in terms of um, uh, air pollution, respiratory disease gains. But the negative externality out of this modeling is that road trauma goes up. Uh, it goes up for Melbourne, Boston, particularly the car dependent cities, but it does so also for London, uh, hardly anything for Copenhagen. 
Uh, in fact, you know, you may as well say there's no change in, in terms of road trauma with Copenhagen. And interestingly, there's almost no change in Delhi, uh, which is a surprising result. And, and the reality there is in terms of our modeling, why we didn't see it getting worse in, in Delhi is in part because of the very mixed modes of transport they operate and the very low speeds that they typically operate at as well. So road trauma is not as much of a, a concern there. Um, and uh, this slide, I, I really, I don't really need to go into. All it really did highlight, does highlight and it, is that in a city like Melbourne, you could implement infrastructure that allowed the vulnerable road users like the cyclists or the walking or the pedestrians, they could have protected infrastructure. And if you did that, what, how this slide starts uh, sort of asking how much of the infrastructure do you need to change to achieve the reduction in the road trauma that we just observed in that modeling? Um, so that takes me then to uh, some of what we're doing now. So, uh, I mean, I'm happy to either take a few questions now and move to the next or, or just continue through. Um, well, I think, um, I don't think that there are questions for now. So, or if they are, so I would propose keep going. And then we have a question around at the very end of the prison. Okay. The, well, so that, so that was important, I think, particularly important work to quantify how important our land use and urban design, uh, not as much urban design, but certainly our land use and urban planning decisions play on our health outcomes. Uh, and also it highlights the importance of our transport system in mitigating those adverse health outcomes. So uh, I think that's a really important message to take from that. So what we have then done in our um, research lab is now focus on all cities in the world. Uh, this includes Luxembourg. Uh, no, actually, sorry, it won't include any of the cities in Luxembourg because our criteria in this next study is that the city had to have a population over 300,000. So uh, it won't have captured Luxembourg, but it certainly captures many of the cities uh, in countries surrounding Luxembourg. So, um, uh, and what we're looking at here, this is the research lab at the Mel at Melbourne Uni that we, um, uh, where we're working. Uh, and our research lab is made up of um, a number of urban planners. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist, it has engineers, uh, it has psychologists, uh, it has computer scientists, uh, mathematicians. So it's a, very much a focus on urban analytics and, and we use a lot of big data and are aiming to develop, and we're, we are developing a lot of new metrics and new insights into urban design and what we can do, particularly in our cities to get the sustainable out and health outcomes that we're, we're really aiming to achieve. So this study here uses, as, as everyone tends, tends to use now, uh, is using machine learning or artificial intelligence and big data. And what we were able to do is we um, took, uh, as I said, uh, 1,692 cities from around the world. Um, so any city with a population over 300,000. And we then look at, looked at their um, images, their map images, um, Google, um, map images of those cities. We defined the perimeters of those cities and we then divided the cities into four by 400 um, metre um, map images. So for predominantly most cities had about 1,000 sample uh, um, of map Im images that we looked at. Um, and within those map images, we looked specifically at uh, the road networks, the rail um, transit networks and green and blue space. And what we did is we stripped everything else off the map. So uh, if it was in Luxembourg, you would have your uh, street names or in Paris, you had this, this you know, distinctive French um, name. Uh, and that would have obviously in machine learning would have picked up the name and defined it as a French city. So we stripped every city of um, any identifiable um, uh, image uh, or text uh, so that you basically had what we were sampling for every city was what these two illustrations here are. This is uh, a four by 400 meter image of Paris. Um, and you can see the orange is the public transit, the black lines are the road networks, the green is the green space and the blue is the blue space. Um, so we had this, uh, we had a massive database comprising mi many millions of, um, of images. Um, from these 1,692 cities. 
Now, what we wanted to do is we trained the, the models using machine learning to identify, to cluster together. And we used a thing called path analysis. And this next slide highlights this sort of path analysis. So basically what it's highlighting here is that um, any city that would fall under, so, so the first part of this is what we found was there are about um, nine city typologies that we came up with. So it's, it's basically highlighting that there are unique urban design features um, in all of those cities, and those unique uh, design features cluster into certain groupings. And this you know, piece of art here really just highlights those groupings, and there are nine groupings. Um, what it does, important to highlight from this path analysis, is if you're a city that falls in this category one here, you are very, you would never fall in uh, category five here. So the distance between one and five is important. You're never likely to be classified in category one when you're in category five and vice versa. And the same from over here, to over nine to over six, very, very different cities in terms of their urban design. Uh, however, there obviously is a little bit of overlap between two and three, but there is a point where it becomes much clearer that it's a category two versus category three. So let's just look quickly then at what those um, <coughs> excuse me, category types are. Um, these are the nine category types that we uh, have referred to as urban typologies. And um, <coughs> sorry, I should have filled up my water before I started. Um, you can see here, we've used uh, um, some uh, high profile in Australia, urban planners, architects, uh, urban designers, who, who looked at these uh, particular maps that we had developed, which we'd identified through machine learning, uh, and they came up with uh, um, these classifications. So um, just to give you one illustration here, um, one of the cluster six is called what we've defined as a motor city. And this is a city with medium to low density. Uh, it has high capacity grid based road networks with medium railed transport. So the typical cities, and if you can just see in that um, column, column here, I have presented this to colleagues in the Asia Pacific area, and I classified all the cities in the Asia Pacific region based on their typologies. And you can see that in this part of the world, only 12 cities fall into the motor city type, and they are predominantly um, the Australian and New Zealand cities. Um, whereas the majority in Asia Pacific uh, are made up of this city type, which is irregular and informal, which talks predominantly around the low, the low uh, income countries where there is little in the way of infrastructure. Now, this is, to our knowledge, one of the first times where we've used these very objective measures to identify city urban typologies um, or city typologies. And um, so this could be a moot point. I mean, you know, we're open to had to discuss this with colleagues around the world. Uh, we have published this recently in the, uh, the Lancet um, Planetary Health, uh, I think it is, Planetary Health Journal. Um, but if we look, what we the reason why we wanted to understand these city typologies is we wanted to understand, are there differences? These are highlighting to us that there are distinct urban designs for cities that come from historical routes through urban planners uh, from Spain, for example. We, we could see that there were quite a lot of parallels between Spain and Latin America with some of the cities. Um, so there are historical elements to these typologies of which you know, we've been highly objected, object, objective here based on the approach we've used. Um, but we did this in part because we wanted to see if there are distinct differences in health as a consequence of urban design. Um, so let me just skip through these. 
And it's important to look at this also um, city, th this urban typology um, based on countries as well. Now, this, this is a, a nice piece of art, look good on your wall, but it, basically what it's highlighting here is that there are some distinct patterns to the urban topologies that we've identified um, based on the cities, uh, uh, based on countries, I should say. So let me just take a quick look at this so you, and, and zoom in on it so you can see it more clearly. Uh, if we take this end, these two ends, um, you know, what, this, this end here and, and this end here, and I just zoom in on them um, and bring them together and zoom it out so you can actually see it. What, it starts to give us quite a, a, an insight around urban design um, by countries as well. So all the green that we're seeing here highlights that there's only really typically one urban typology in those countries. Uh, and that is a green one, which is one that's saying high transit. So basically what it says is these cities or all these countries have invested in high uh, public transit type uh, city design. Um, so they've invested in public transit. And, and if you look at it, it's Denmark, it's the Netherlands, it's Ireland, Japan, Norway, Singapore, Switzerland, the UK and Sweden. So interesting, I mean, there's a few exceptions in these, these ones here, but interestingly that there's a real uniformity in urban design in some of these countries here. If we flick over to this side, you see a lot of variation in the urban design, the urban topologies. Um, so if we took, for example, China, we're seeing um, blue, the blue, which was, uh, I can't even remember these now, informal, the orange, which is the um, uh, irregular design, the black is the intense. Uh, and, and so you can see here what, we're, what we found when we looked at China, for example, that within China, there is enormous variation in the urban design from the east coast of China, where you're seeing high transit type cities that are invested in public transit uh, and high density in terms of populations through to the west parts of China, the western cities of China, which have very little in the way of infrastructure uh, and uh, are very much reflecting more of a low income style city design. So, and it's interesting that, uh, I mean, in Russia, you sort of have one typical urban design, um, but in, in some of these other, as, as you do in El Salvador, but in um, just trying to look at another one, like in Pakistan, there's a variety of urban topologies as well. So, and very interesting I, I, when we started to look at this and break it down by countries as well. Now, um, what we wanted to do was to use, to use this technique, as I said, in relation to trying to understand, um, oops, I'm going backwards, I think. Let me, let's, let's just go back this way. Sorry. Hmm. It's taking. Apologies, um, let's see what's happening here. Sorry, it's going around in a loop and it's not moving to the next okay. slide. Try leaving the presentation mode and then entering it again on the right slide. Maybe that would work. Here we go. Now it's working now. Yep. Perfect. Great. So um, what we then wanted to look at was to look at these nine urban designs um, and look at them in relation to road trauma. And the reason why we looked at road trauma was that uh, there is very little in the way of city specific um, health indicators um, and to find them for the 1692 cities was very challenging. So what was easy for us to do was to find estimates of road trauma by country and in some many instances by city. So we looked at the outcome in this instance of road trauma and in particular given we had focused our attention on road transit, on public transit and, um, and road networks, it made sense to look at do we see variation in road trauma based on the urban design of the city. Um, so this slide here, really what it highlights is just what extent these cities have invested in infrastructure, road infrastructure particularly. Um, and you can see, uh, this is a quantification based on the map 
uh, maps that we've seen in those cities, you can see that the cluster nine or the urban typology nine, which is sparse, you can see very little in the way of, um, of investment and in infrastructure. Uh, whereas the motor city, as you might expect, has you know incredible level of uh, infrastructure uh, for investment. Uh, and the, the motor cities are very much those Australian or the US Canadian cities. So then what we wanted to do is overlay uh, the trauma rates. Um, road trauma is the blue. Um, so that's the overall road trauma rate. And then we might look at it in relation to pedestrian injuries, cyclist injuries, uh, and motorcycle injuries. Um, and you can see you know, clearly that um, we get, overall, we get pretty low um, motorcycle and cyclist injuries and pedestrian injuries in those motor cities. Um, and, and part of this just reflects exposure. Very few of these motor cities like in the US are designed for the motor vehicle. So you'd expect to see higher rates of road trauma, which you do see, but you see very little in the way of vulnerable road users being uh, you know, injured to a high extent. But looking at this, what really came out fascinating to us is if you were to invest in cities in relation to transport, um, your best investment would be uh, an urban design feature that reflected cluster eight, which is the intense city uh, um, urban design. And, and that delivered the least amount of road trauma overall. Uh, and it did for all of the vulnerable road users, the motorcyclists, the pedestrians, and the cyclists. And the intense, um, it, it goes really, it reflects exactly what I've just said in terms of our modeling. The intense urban design is the compact city type urban design. It's the cities that have high population densities. They also have invested in extensively in public transit. So those are the cities that we're seeing. And if we look at and go back to that previous slide where I looked also at emissions, the emissions are much reduced uh, in these cities as well. So uh, that was a, a, you know, a really unique piece of work to illustrate again just the importance of, uh, look, this is not causal relationships, but it's a very important point and pointing to the direction that urban design and how we uh, uh, plan uh, for a land use has substantial impact on the health of its citizens. Um, and there hasn't been a great deal of work in this. Um, and and uh, so I think this is incredibly important and something we need to begin to focus our attention on. And in part, the reason it hasn't probably been focused on is that um, we, we've typically um, measured, when we measure infrastructure investments, we haven't typically assess the health co-benefits or adverse health um, associated with that sort of level of infrastructure. Um, and I think when we start to begin to put some of these sort of metrics into those infrastructure questions, it is likely to give us a quite a different answer. So uh, I'm just going to conclude now. Uh, there was one other question, I, and I know um, Lex had asked me for a few questions if I could you know, address a number of questions. One was around your free transport in, in Luxembourg. And I, I think I've sort of discussed that on a number of occasions. I think the metrics that we're pointing out here in our work really points to the value add that public transit can provide, uh, not only in terms of reduced emissions and the environment, but certainly in relation to health co benefits. Um, and uh, as I just alluded to a moment ago, those outcomes aren't typically put into a cost benefit analysis uh, when you're looking at infrastructure. Um, public transit and health are, are really important. They are important, but they're also a challenge in the COVID period. And I, I can talk as an epidemiologist a little bit more about that. Um, and then the final question Nick's asked me was, you know, just what will we see post COVID? And maybe I should just conclude with a few of the points from this presentation um, that I've just highlighted now that with that modal shift, you know, we are likely to see reduced emissions um, and, and enormous health gain, which is really, we cannot underestimate that. There really needs to be a, a movement towards that. Um, the, the other point, I guess I, I wanted to highlight from this presentation is that 
we're using a whole array of new techniques here and, uh, and developing up some new techniques. And it's providing us with us, it's providing us with some new insights uh, around the role that urban form uh, contributes to not only delivering transport in our cities, but importantly, the health of our citizens. Um, and I would encourage you to keep exploring that complexity um, because the 21st century is entirely about the interaction of the multiple of multiple urban systems uh, and of paramount importance is just how sustainable our cities, how they must become totally sustainable uh, given this enormous climate challenge that we're faced here uh, and, and everywhere actually. So, um, so I think those are the points that I have to highlight in this presentation and then maybe I'll take offline some of what will we see post COVID and in terms of our cities and, and transport and, and our urban form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very interesting presentation. Um, maybe I could, we could now switch over to the discussion round and I could open the discussion um, and also encourage our participants to ask questions. Um, but maybe as an opener, a very first question from my side. You mentioned this um, very shortly that uh, this health dimension should become more important in urban planning or influencing land use decisions. Then what would be your recommendation of how to strengthen this dimension in land use decisions? Is it by the means of a simple cost benefit ana analysis or are there other instruments that you consider more effective? Good question. Um, uh, I guess, as I said at the outset, I'm an epidemiologist, not a planner. But um, I, look, I I think it's it's incredibly challenging. I mean, it, it, you know, the decision making around infrastructure is highly politicised, and um, and and so you need to take to the table the best evidence that you can. Um, and certainly uh, a, a cost benefit analysis that highlights the health co-benefits or, or, or the adverse um, of that um, are important. And, uh, and to my knowledge here in Australia, we seldom do that other than to say maybe there's going to be a reduction in emissions or there might be an increase in emissions, but we don't extend it to be, uh, to be able to say, well, actually, that potentially leads to X number of premature years of life loss as a consequence of that. Um, and if we put a price on that and, and we estimate based on a statistical life, then you, you, know, you can put a value around that. So, so there's that. But I guess the other point in relation to urban planning is, um, you know, is, the, is the governance. It's, it's around highlighting that it, it's, not as, it's not as linear in terms of how you go about doing your job any longer. Um, the, the Department of Planning really needs to be across a whole array of other um, systems and other departments. And typically I've uh, found here in Australia, but I think it's just human nature, we like to operate in vertical silos. And, and as a consequence, we need to be operating it horizontally. It's much harder to do that. It's much easier for planners to talk to planners uh, or, or doctors or epidemiologists to talk to each other. It's much harder for an epidemiologist to step inside a planning uh, department and talk through you know, what I'm doing here. Uh, I, you know, I've had to physically, I've moved myself into a school of design and architecture as an epidemiologist to get my head around some of this and understand how they talk and think, you know, and that's a challenge. And so I think that's always going to be a challenge, no, whether it's Luxembourg or, or whether it's France. There, you know, I've worked for the WHO and it operates in vertical silos all the time, even just how the WHO operates. And I'm saying WHO because it's very close to you guys in terms of Geneva. But basically they when they go into countries they can only talk to the ministry of health and yet they try and operate across the environment they're even thinking around planning issues now um, and yet to only be able to to present things to a minister of health is is devoid of how we need to be operating in terms of our urban health and urban systems and so that's probably the biggest challenge i think for planning is to ensure that you go in armed with 
the transport people behind you and understanding clear around what the challenges are associated with this if they move down with this infrastructure. The planners understand the land use mixes. The health people are aware of you, you, you do this, what, what, what are the consequences that we're seeing now? Those sorts of things so that you can all come to the table. That hasn't been, I don't think we can, I have never seen it happen. Uh, and it, it's a, maybe a utopian, you know, expectation of mine, but uh, I'd hoped that we could achieve that. Thank you very much for this very good response, or very interesting response, I would say. Are there any questions from the audience that, to Mr. Stevenson, to Mark? Yes, there's one question in the chat um, from Frederick. Actually, it refers to the COVID-19 effects. I just read it out loud and maybe then you can react afterwards, Mark. Um, COVID-19 was briefly mentioned in the beginning. If we were to combine this research with insights on how urban form and the use of public transport impact the epidemiologic situation in the city, would the results change? And if yes, how? Um, yeah, a, a good question. Um, uh, you know, Melbourne went through a, a second wave that was very substantial um, late last year. And, you know, I was asked often about public transit and transmission. Clearly, you know, in, you know, traveling in confined spaces, um, did you know contributes to transmission um, but we also as our research group we actually did the modeling for our state um, for COVID-19 and uh, and the state government followed our models uh, in terms of lockdown and when they could open up again uh, and the key to that was mask wearing and and we got mask wearing on public transit very we, we implemented it very very quickly um, because you know we didn't want to see huge decline in our public transit. It's a huge investment. Uh, it's a great way of reducing the congestion in our cities, even though there wasn't so much in congestion as everyone started to you know, stay off public transit. And, and well, there was, I should say, they all moved onto cars, but then we went to lockdown and it stopped completely. But um, the mask wearing was really imperative strategy, important strategy, and still is um, in terms of the COVID world we live in. So that was, that was key to it. And the sooner a city got to implementing that, the better at walls. Um, we also, uh, I've been advocating also for QR codes on all public transit so that you um, can tap on and tap off so that we can actually assist contact tracing also in the event of transmission. And, and that's a really another really important part that public transit can, can play in, uh, in controlling transmission, ensuring that we can trace when a person was on public transit and who was on it with them at the same time so that we could contact trace them and let them know that they need to isolate. So, um, so there, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question as well as, uh, as I'd hope, but I think um, public transit had a bad rap, uh, as you probably will have had in Luxembourg as well, when we're, we're when COVID is, um, is highly prevalent. Um, but we were able to mitigate that through mask wearing and good contact tracing measures using, you know, for those who are on public transit. So uh, it's not one, and, and I would, with those strategies in place, what we're seeing now is public transit, people are back on public transit. And uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not sure if it is in Luxembourg as well now or, and the number's still really low. Well, actually, uh, just a few years, just a few weeks ago, the um, passenger numbers for the National Railway Company have been published, and in 2020, you have, you see a drop of 71 percent of passengers transported in contrast to the year before. And I would say that so far it is not yet up to the level of pre-pandemic, but we still are in the pandemic. But it, uh, the effects have been quite dramatic on the passengers. On the same time, you see much more people traveling by car. So there was a, clearly a modal shift. Yeah. Have you observed yeah. something similar in Melbourne as well? Yeah, look, it's crept back up again, but not to the same extent as it was pre-COVID. Uh, are they wearing masks in, in Luxembourg? Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. actually, I think that is also one of the things that sticks out. There were was not a single infringement 
infringement of mask rules in trains recorded yet. So um, people really wow. stick to the recommendations and therefore it is quite respected. That's fantastic. Well, we, we have that challenge <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, you know, but it is being enforced. So um, even one of our, our deputy prime minister that I heard today was um, was fined for not wearing his mask mm. inside. <laughs> um, so they're following up on them. Oh, that's good. Good to be so strict. Yeah. Um, there would be room for some further questions from the audience. You can either switch on your microphone, ask it directly, or switch on your microphone and the camera, or also ask a question in the chat. If not, I would have uh, another question that I could ask you, Mark. Um, you mentioned uh, um, in the, I think in the first section of your presentation that you analyzed, you also looked at cities and how um, and how, how the space, how land use was, was organized. And you also looked at the different arrangements of land use and what are the public health benefits. I remember this was higher density, so simply having higher density districts, also the distance to uh, public transport modes. So how far is public transport located from housing or from uh, your workplace? And also um, the diversity in land use, so the functional mixity. Which one of these three would you consider as most beneficial to public health? Yeah, that, look, that's a, a good question and one we haven't been able to answer. In fact, what I'm keen to do is begin some experiments around understanding compact, what compactness means, because um, it really depends on the outcome measures that you're interested in looking at. Um, so th that, uh, that we, we, we really can't answer. Um, the challenge we have is that was a model and it was easy to change proportions and attribute um, uh, benefits associated with that that we know through the literature but um, the challenge lies with um, like a city like melbourne um, within 10 kilometers of the center central business district we have a, a city that's sort of very similar to London. It's high density, great public transport, um, and why Melbourne gets voted the most livable city and one of the most livable cities in the world, because it's got amenities, it's very nice to live in. But uh, beyond that 10 kilometers, it's uh, a typical American city, it's urban sprawl. And, and so it's, you know, we've just put this broad brush in that model and say, oh, well, we change it everywhere and you'll get this benefit. The reality is you don't get that benefit. Uh, it has to be a Durban, uh, sorry, the, the dog's going crazy with a toy. Um, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not homogeneous across the whole city. It, it's very heterogeneous and it really is dependent on the levels of current density that are available. So, uh, you know, the, the European cities that have the historic elements to them that are ones of greater density, um, they are likely to benefit the most. Um, than you know what we see in this, those sort of motor cities. So the biggest challenges really lie in the motor cities, uh, and and Melbourne's making a real effort to change that completely. But you know there's all of those vast American cities which would would require just an incredible turnaround. Yeah. But to answer your question, we can't give you the specific whether it's which which D of those land use um, dimensions is the most um, powerful. There is work by um, Severo, which you may, you, many of you may probably be very familiar with, where he did look at um, at some of the the weights associated with the types density and diversity and distance and and uh, and so there is that in the literature but that that really was more of a, a sort of meta-analysis type thing it wasn't as empirical as, as what we've done here okay but i think it's also quite a lot dependent on the local context and also about how public transport um what's the image of public transport and the use in the local population yeah yeah there's a whole bunch of parameters there around safety um and and frequency and so there's you know a lot of those things we've, we've sort of really looked at it at a macro level to highlight you know there is some unique elements here but to delve down into it and, and be able to specifically say you need to design this level of density uh, and this type of land use mix 
that we haven't achieved and it would be great but I, I don't actually know if it's like it's likely to be a recipe as straightforward as that because of the dynamic elements of cities uh, anyway and the, i think there's no one size fits all solution yeah it's just complex yeah. questions yeah. yeah maybe any further questions from the audience maybe one <laughs> Um, there's a lot of talk about the 15-minute uh, city, uh, especially in, in, in Europe. I read this morning, a friend of mine, he's visiting Amsterdam, and I told him, look at Amsterdam as you knew it uh, 10 years ago, where there are already a lot of bicycle infrastructure, and now they are taking away uh, 1,000, up to 1,500 parking spots per year. Uh, and they are doing this for the next 15 years and they have uh, now bicycle routes that go from one end from Amsterdam to the other and uh, with all the parking space they take away they open the city for even more um, uh, local shopping facilities and, and cafes and so on so for me I, I, that was I, what I thought this morning uh, this would also have an in, direct impact on, on public health because people are rediscovering their, their neighborhoods. Uh, they are able to, to fulfill all their needs within 15 minutes. Um, is that a subject that you are also discussing during your, your research? Uh, look, yes. Um, it is something we, when we haven't done any research on 15 minute or in, in Melbourne, we refer to the 20 minute city. 20 minute. Um, um, but I, I think um, the thing I, I feel about that is I, I think unless you are working off, uh, I think one of the urban typologies that we've highlighted, which is the density ones, uh, and you're not operating out of a motor city type urban design, uh, I think it's tangible, but I think, um, in in cities like Melbourne or, or some of the cities in the US, I think that becomes an academic exercise. It's one where the urban planner says we will aim for a 20 minute cities and we'll have hubs here and here and here and here. Um, but, you know, there are challenges, there's major challenges to operationalize those. Um, and I think the, the operationalizing of them requires, you know, really proactive policy. Uh, and I think what we see, I, I can say that in relation to Australia, our transport policy is woeful and it is not, it is not futuristic at all. Um, and and it, is, it is really been garnered, I think, by the motor, the automobile industry. So there are challenges there. So what I then see, and I, maybe I'm becoming a bit more cynical as I get older, but I, I sort of think, yes, we've got a 20 minute city plan in Melbourne, but I think it's more of an academic exercise without, you know, sound policy behind it. Whereas mm -hmm. what you've just highlighted, Claude, in, in Amsterdam is highly tangible. It's a high density, um, in compact city, which is amenable to other modes of transport, uh, sustainable modes of transport, and amenity with, with the densities associated with it allows you to ensure that people can get to places within that short time distance. So. Uh, it's it's a tangible, and so I think uh, that urban typology study that we did, I think, is probably is a useful insight around what cities are. You know, maybe what we should be asking ourselves in our next piece of work is what cities globally might be able to change achieve a fifteen minute um, city uh, based on the urban typologies that we have explored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the same goes for 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 Barcelona with the superblock. Uh, that's uh, another density, even another density in the, of the city. But that's more like um, I feel it more like retrofitting uh, than Amsterdam. Amsterdam starts on a good base already. Yeah, yeah. I I published on the superblock with colleagues at the um, Barcelona Institute for Global Health, um, at, where they looked at the three superblocks that were um, were implemented under the mayor, um, and uh, and the health gains were considerable. But the reality oh, yeah. is they've got three, they've got three hundred and fifty seven of those, and yet only three have been looked at. So mm -hmm. again, it gets down to leadership, governance, and policy. 
Um, and despite knowing now that if they were able to change some of these features, you can actually get considerable benefit, not only in terms of the economy, um, but in terms of health. Uh, so, uh, you know, and that's perfectly set up, you know, with, um, you know, the design that's been created from the 1850s. So, um, you know, there's win-wins that could be achieved, but it requires, it really does require leadership. And that requires, you know, there's always a lot of backlash for some of these things. And why we need good evidence. We need really good evidence and uh, to be presented. As we always tend to say, as soon as there's a political way, way, will, there's also a way. So it really depends on the pol policy or politics behind. Yeah, yeah it, it does. Yeah, it does. Okay. Thank you very much for the question, also for the answer. Um, are there further questions? Yeah, maybe on a question about scale of, you mostly talked about a larger city as our uh, metropolises. Uh, Claude talked about the super block, most of Luxembourgish municipalities, we could may maybe fit into one of those blocks. So what's your perspective on smaller cities or smaller um, rural areas? within your discussions or what's your perspective on those or what would be, you, be your recommendations? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I just think this is a dimension thing rather than a, maybe a population a density. Um, I think, uh, not, I haven't been to Luxembourg, but I'm assuming it's, you know, you know maybe, I don't know. Are there walled cities or is there anything like that? Um, I mean, surely it's it's pretty old. So um, I think you know there is every opportunity to ensure that. I mean, I would be pushing for sustainability as number one, um, and uh, and therefore you've got the compactness already. Um, so and you've also got the public transit operating. Uh, I think what would be fantastic to highlight are some of the policies that you're implementing. I mean, there's nowhere in the world I know that had implemented free public transit. Now, um, you know, I've just finished some work looking at um, road safety. Can we change drivers' behaviour by insurance premiums and incentivising? And we've been able to show you can. So actually, what it highlights is that policy can drive you know, urban form and the urban planning in an enormous way. Um, and it can be incentivizing. And, and I see you know, providing free public transport, is it incentivizing or is it, is it just a given? I mean, what we know, I mean, the health economists talk about, there's, there's a point where if it's free, people don't use it, but if there's a, some, some level of charge, you will get, or, or you may get some, a better return in terms of change of behavior. So these are the sort of things I think in Luxembourg where you're prepared to even go free, um, you, that you could use some unique incentives to influence policies in, in the direction of sustainability uh, and ultimately is in terms of major you know, health care benefits. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, actually, I think it's also an incremental process that you, needs to be considered. So, um, for instance, in Luxembourg, it's now the, it depends a lot on politics, that's what I want to say, because for nearly 40 years after the Second World War, or since the Second World War, we actually had very conservative branded um, policies, which uh, have put uh, the individual mobility in up front, so as a first priority. And only since two legislative periods, we actually see have different political parties governing, and therefore we see a slow change. But of course, it's not a in, it's not a interruption where from one day to another you see a difference. But it's an incremental process where also a lot of learning uh, of the politicians, but also of the population, uh, needs to be done. I think, and therefore it's it's a slow process. But of course, uh, after a certain time, you come up at the at, at your objectives, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I think we need to have a baton that we keep passing on to the next one and the next one to keep the, the direction, the vision moving forward. Um, uh, you know, and I guess, you know, the, the vision needs to be one of sustainability. You know, that's what defines the 21st century transport uh, and ought to design, you know, to define our urban design um, for that. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I would um, 
like to thank you, Mark, for the uh, your very interesting presentation. And uh, I think uh, I would then move over to closing the um, presentation for today, or the CPU clock for today. So very, very warm. Thank you very much from Luxembourg to Australia. And uh, I think well. for you, it's now the end of the day. So you can leave you happy. Yeah, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. OK, good. Then I think it's time uh, for no, 20 to eight. Yep, 20 to eight. Yes. Maybe you need to walk the dog, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I know. She gets under my feet all the time. <laughs> uh, then I would very shortly like to remind you of our next uh, CIPO colloque, uh, which is to be held next week, uh, Tuesday. And we will focus on the topic of reclaiming the streets, Velo Rotation and Car Free City, where we have examples from Brussels and from Oslo. And with these words, uh, I would like to thank you again, Mark. Um, and then also thank all our participants for um, today's presence. Thank you. Thank you. Bye thank bye. you, Mark. Thank you. Bye bye.